Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back. Happy Monday. I know, everybody's favorite day of the week, right? <laughs> uh, so, it is Monday, and that means we are returning to the Real Chat videos as we continue on with the discussions of some of my over con overseas contracting jobs. So, uh, last time we discussed uh, AC First, and um, that was in Afghanistan. I was only there for about eight months between uh, June, between the December of 2018 up until about August or so of uh, 2019. So, well, nine months, but December doesn't count. I wasn't in country yet. Um, after coming home from AC First, and as you guys, you know, know because you probably seen the last video, one of the worst companies on the planet. And I knew that going in that it was a bad company. I always say contractors talk and you see you see what they do in the workplace. You see what the contractors have to put up with. You hear talk from others. You never hear a positive word from for for local for uh, employees who work for AC First. But I was desperate for an overseas job and I gave up my dream job here in, in Louisville with Raytheon to take that overseas contract to jump with AC first. I would have loved one of the bigger companies, but I had to settle. You know, you basically gotta take whatever job is available and who's hiring. So um I was home for about four months. Uh in December or so I I got picked up again by Lockheed Martin once again. I had reached out to the, pr the previous uh, program manager for Lockheed Martin, and um, he had just taken over as program manager of that contract, the soft contract, the soft CLSS contract, uh, probably in 2017. You know, when I was passing through Fayetteville on my way out of the company back in 2017, uh, he was basically uh, moved into the, the big seat, you know, several months prior. So he was, he was still with Lockheed. Uh, and when I reached out to him, I just wanted to see if there were any jobs available he knew about. And he told me about this warehouse position. Like, hey, can you handle this warehouse job? Shoot, that's the warehouse is my background. I mean, I was a uh, I, I worked the SSA. I worked the warehouse in in the army. Heck yeah, I feel comfortable doing the warehouse. Probably even a much better position doing warehousing work than I did, you know, as a unit supply specialist the first time I worked for us uh, for Lockheed Martin. So, uh, January 2020, I officially started work with Lockheed Martin, and uh, you guys remember the first time I worked for them. If you can recall my my, Lock, my initial Lockheed Martin video, I was just so completely displeased with everything from the get-go that was going on with the company. Uh, basically... You know, here's a map, here's our address, you know, get your own car, you know, pay for your own car, go to this hotel, meet us here at this address, like, you know, you're new to the city, you're lost. When you're actually going through orientation, nobody's sitting with you and, and basically teaching you things that you needed to know. You're doing all these classes and, you know, maybe it's unfamiliar to you, so it's just weird stuff. The second time, my second exposure to Lockheed Martin was absolutely amazing. And I think one of the girls that were initially uh, kind of like doing like the packets for new hires, you know, she did everything like uh, through through email and whatnot. And uh, the next, the t first time I actually met her in person was the second time I worked for Lockheed. And she was actually in charge of like helping with the classes and doing all the training, you know, talk about like, how to fill out your timesheets, stuff like that, you know, you know, basic uh, corporate work, uh, corporate uh, orientation. Someone from HR came down and actually walked us through the 401k plan. So Lockheed had 401k plan that you pay into, but the company also matches and then puts extra in. They also do, um, you also get company, uh, company stocks as well. So, you know, that was already put up and, and established. And basically they teach you about these. They teach you about the 401k plan. They go over each of your benefits for your medical. So you're not just just choosing some random thing just because it's there. They actually took the time to, to make sure that we were taken care of. So right off the bat, or we haven't even gotten to the comp to the actual work. And it was already 20,000 times better than my first exposure uh, with Lockheed Martin and orientation. What I also liked is because of 
Actually, no, it, it didn't happen this time. Um, that's going to be the next job. Uh, so, you know, we go through a week of orientation in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, and then we get plane tickets and we have to go down to El Paso. And um, in El Paso, you go to Fort Bliss, Texas. That's where the military has additional training, uh, you know, rollover drills, stuff like that. You get military gear that you need for overseas deployments, all that stuff. So going to uh, going to Camp Arif John Kuwait. Uh, so I was assigned to the warehouse in Kuwait. And I, I thought it was going to be actual SSA stuff. But no, it, it's um, because it's Special Forces. Special Forces does everything different than regular Army. So... Being part of the soft contract was completely different, but you're still using the new mil army GCSS army system. So and those systems are all incorporated. All of these different systems from logistics side, the maintenance side, and all that unit level to brigade level. That's all been mashed together into one single system. And so it, it was a nice no, new experience, kind of to see how things are done from a different point of view. But a lot of the work was redundant, though. It's like we'd count, uh, we'd have to pull, you'd have probably 20 AK 47s in a, in a crate, and you got like 20 crates stacked on top of each other, and you got to pull out pallet after pallet. And we're basically counting the exact same conics day after day. So when I said it was redundant, it was really redundant. Uh, I said that the orientation was a breath of fresh air. When I first got to Kuwait, the warehouse manager. And, uh, at the time, um, a man named, uh, Samuel Carr, he was theater lead. So he was in charge of the guys in Kuwait, uh, guys in Iraq, Syria, Jordan. So when, when I first got there and I, I sat down with them for the first time, they said one word, one word that made my experience with Lockheed Martin the second time better than my entire year and a half that I spent with Lockheed the first time. They said, Welcome. <laughs> uh, for those who may not have seen my previous Lockheed Martin uh, video, uh, when I first got hired, I got hired in May 2016. And uh, I was originally scheduled to go to Jordan, but, or no, not Jordan, Turkey. I was scheduled for Turkey. Uh, but I asked the program manager if there was availability in Afghanistan. I wanted to go back to Afghanistan, and a few weeks in or a few days into uh, being with um, going through CRC in Fort Bliss, I got a call said, "Yeah, you know, Afghan has a slot open. We're moving you that way." I'm like, "Sweet." So, um, and when I got to Afghanistan, uh, the senior supply manager, whatever the heck he, his title was. Um, yeah, so like we were all supply technicians, so he was just probably senior supply technician or, or something like that. Uh, logist, no, we were logistical management analysts. That was our job title, and he was senior logistical management analyst. So, uh, you know, just the way he kind of like sized me up, looked me up and down when I first got to the to the airport, uh, right there on Bagram. You know, made this way doesn't help me with my bags. Doesn't really talk to me, introduce himself or nothing. Not really. Uh, we drive on to Camp Vance, which is the SOCOM uh, base on Bagram. And uh, when we walk into the building, you know, he doesn't introduce me to anybody. He doesn't say, hey, this is where you're going to be sitting. This is where you're going to be working. No, he, he basically walks ahead of me. I see him walking around the backside. Of the, and uh, a few minutes later, I've got the chief warrant officer coming and screaming at me, asking for my resume. And I find out months later from the supply tech, uh, from the supply sergeant there that, uh, that he tried to get me fired. Like, what the hell? <laughs> like, I literally just... And I didn't say nothing. I didn't do nothing. Uh, what the hell? Uh, he probably saw my resume and saw that I was a 9-2 Alpha in the Army. And this was 9-2 Yankee work. I'm like, whatever. You know, supply... Military supply to me is military supply. You know, you're not really having to learn all these different things for the first time. You might new, have new information, but you're still doing military logistics in the, at the end of the day. So... My second time around, uh, working the warehouse with Lockheed in uh, in Kuwait, just to have them welcome me the first day, I mean, that brings a tear to your eyes. I mean, it's something so small, but you know what? It's the smallest things in life that mean the difference. And 
that it, the smallest things that mean the world to you. Just the fact that, you know, I wasn't having people scamming behind my back to try and get me fired right off the bat, that was so incredible. Uh, the, the, the people I worked with were, were amazing. In fact, uh, I, for whatever reason, I thought once I got out of the Army, you had to be military retired in order to get VA benefits or go to the VA hospitals or anything like that. So up until uh, 2021... Uh, right after I came home with my injury, um, that's the first time I really ever went to the VA, and and I, obviously nowadays I'm I'm grateful for it because you know without my VA you know retirement pay and all that, you know I would be struggling I'd be struggling big time. Um, none of this would be here, and bill wise, I don't know I I feel like I would have to settle for like a call center job making nine dollars an hour again. And I did that once. I, I don't want everyone to go back to that again. That was terrible. But, uh, yeah, working in the warehouse was awesome. A uh, lot of sitting around, but, you know, when there was work to do, you know, we knock it out immediately. And then you go back to sitting down around. And, that, and that's what it should be. You know, you're not just doing work just to say that you're working. I mean, especially if you're just doing the same thing over and over again. It, it becomes redundant. And you're what are you doing? You're exhausting your staff. So when it's time to do things that really are important, like, uh, you know, full 100% inventory or 100% layout during, like, change of command ceremonies or stuff like that, or change of responsible officers, etc. You know, you're, uh, you're, you've been doing all this hard work, slaving over these conixes day after day, doing redundant work, and now you they want you to go super fast through these layouts, and your body just can't handle it because you're it's taxing. You're in Kuwait. Kuwait, to me, has always been like the hottest place on the planet. You know, it could be like 3 a.m. and it's like 130 degrees outside. So imagine how it is, in, especially in the middle of summer, in like 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That sun boiling on you in the warehouse. There's there's no air coming in. Those little fans that they got for you don't do anything. It's just, uh, it's just a horrible experience. I mean that that's not the horrible thing. It's just like me. I I like cold weather, so anytime that there's heat involved, I uh, have an issue with it. But I mean, you guys already know, man. Shoot, most of my twenties and shoot, most of my thirties have been spent in you know that type of environment. You know, uh, extremely warm weather, desert areas and whatnot. So uh, Lockheed Martin, um, they really it's like night and day in comparison between the two, uh, the two times I worked for them at some point, uh, could we, they, we did live off post. So we lived out in the economy and me and a roommate, we had this beautiful, ex gorgeous three bedroom apartment. Yeah. Cause the one, the, the, I guess the main bedroom is for like supervisors or leads or something. So, or for senior staff, and uh, that one was always locked out, but that had a bathroom in there. Crazy big room. And then you had like two bedrooms at the end of the hall. Then you had like another, uh, I guess, uh, what do they call them? The butler quarters or something like that. It's a small bedroom, but it's got its own bathroom. So, shoot. You probably had three bathrooms in that apartment, so that was really nice. When I say Kuwait does it big, I mean, they... Those apartments must have cost like three grand for each apartment. Now imagine all the people that you had living in those apartments. Um, beautiful. I, I think it was called Thratcher or, or something like that. Thratcher. Um, but yeah, those apartments were beautiful. Downstairs, uh, we had in this awesome freaking gym. And you know what? When I, when I deployed, I said I was going to work out. And shoot, I'm not as big. I was like getting up there. I was getting like 220 pounds. I'm like, nah, this ain't this ain't healthy. Uh, once you start being to a point where you can barely move, no. Um, in about three or four months, I got down to about 175, 180, probably less than that. You know why? I was going to the gym every single day after work. You know, I get home after work, immediately change out of my clothes, put on my workout clothes. But bam, I'm downstairs for an hour to an hour and a half. And then when COVID kicked in, you know, we were still in going into the apartments. Uh, 
after a while, they shut down the gym, which sucked. You know, I used to always hit up that gym. I always, I freaking lived in that that sauna and the, the hot tubs that they had. I mean, that thing was amazing. Um, and then they basically relegated everybody to to base. So uh, we didn't have, we couldn't go back to the apartments for months. And by time, I, and for me personally, uh, they moved me to uh, Iraq in in uh, end of June. So, um, going to Iraq, man, again, uh, you got these little small shoes that you live in, you know, whatever, no different than what you lived in when you were a soldier, so not a big deal. You and a roommate, you know, nice size room, you know, you're not blocking it off with drapes or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it was really awesome, you know, um, we ran the... The SOCOM yard down there, I forget what we called it. Just this big giant open yard. Whenever new new material came in at the flight line, like if they came out with these new Bearcats, uh, Bearcats are like these, I don't know, super impressive uh, police department types, type tanks type of deal. Uh, if you ever get the opportunity, type in Bearcat in Google or something, see if you can come up with mil some kind of military truck. Those things were badass. I, I think they were made of like Ford or something. So, pick up those, you know, any any military uniforms and stuff. And here's the thing, because we were on the, um, we were on the Iraq contract, so there was, uh, there was a contract for Iraq, and there was a contract for, uh, no, I take it back, I lied. There was a contract for Syria, and there was a contract for Jordan. So, where we were at in uh, our warehouse back in uh, Kuwait, you know, they'd issue the stuff out to... To, to Syria uh, in Erbil, Iraq you know, they'd forward from Kuwait to Iraq Iraq would forward it to Syria um, later on I went to cover down for someone in Syria hold on I'm trying to think how it happened because I got reassigned to, to Syria and I had been asking about Syria because nobody wanted to go to Syria Syria in Iraq you could even though you're not supposed to you know, technically, you got that little placard on your car. You could leave base. You can go down, you know, in in Iraq there, and you could go to restaurants and what have you. Again, you're not supposed to, but people were doing it all the time. Um, so there was there was somewhat freedom uh, for those who live in Iraq and have been there for a long time. Now, for me, I don't care about all that. I'm I'm deployed. I I want to make as much money as humanly possible. Going to Syria gave me that best opportunity. You know, I was still collecting my paycheck the same I would be as if I were in, let's say, Kuwait, for example. Uh, Kuwait and Iraq. I, Iraq gets uplift, so you get paid a little bit more. Syria gets paid even more than that. And you get a per diem, like almost $60 a day. So you're on, you're banking almost two grand extra every month uh, just by, per, just on per diem alone. When I say I loved Syria, Small base, you know, if we needed to go down to the yard, you know, walking-wise was like maybe a seven-minute walk, is, so it's not like crazy. You could literally walk anywhere you needed to go. You know, normally we just jump on a forklift, and a forklift was like our car. <laughs> um, I freaking love Syria, man. There was so much time off, so much time to do other things. You know, if I wanted to do homework, or if I wanted to watch a TV show or something, there was just so much downtime, and... A lot of the military, shoot, those guys are probably sleeping in until like 2 o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> because they stay up all night partying. <laughs> yeah, working on the, on the soft contracts, uh, that's such a different element, and it's so amazing. I've always said, if you take care of the team, the team will take care of you. So, well, the team guys, they're absolutely fantastic. It's the guys that uh, that provide the support. They're part of the unit, but not really team guys, right? Um, some of them are... Well, a lot of the guys like that were really cool, but then you got like Camp Mirrors. Nah, those guys were, were adequate. I mean, there was nothing really wrong with them. No issues, not really. Yeah, I, I don't think I had any problems with anyone out there. Not really. I, mean, I blew up at one of my friends once, but... You know, when you live with someone and you work with someone on a daily basis, eventually, you know, you're, you're going to 
blow up at them. It's gonna happen. You know what? You wait a couple hours, bam. You go back to just the way you were beforehand. You don't think much about it. So anyone that has any, especially if you're mechanic guys, if you guys work on trucks, it doesn't matter if you've never worked on a military a military truck. I mean, you've got your, your diagrams and your manuals and all that stuff. So getting, if you're a mechanic, you can easily get a job overseas. And imagine if you go to Iraq or Syria, the worst thing you got to worry about is the heat. I mean, it, it's definitely worth it. If you're a supply guy and you've and you've got a military background, that's gonna help big time. You you might have to kind of start off the way I did, and that means starting with the company like Combat Support Associates. Com CSA was like it, CSA in Kuwait is like what AC First was in uh, in in uh, Afghanistan. They don't pay well. There's too many employees. <laughs> And they've got some of the dumbest rules. So, Lockheed Martin, I would have actually I had, I had made a plan. I think I, I think I came home for Christmas. Yeah, so I got to. I, I left for uh, Lockheed Martin in January 2020, and. I came home in December of 2020 uh, for vacation, so I was home in R&R &R for three weeks. And when I got back to Iraq, because uh, you, you fly directly into the Erbil Iraq airport, so you know you're not going from like or from like home to like Kuwait and then flying from Kuwait military flight to Erbil. I mean you can, but no, there, there was a direct flight right into Erbil, so. And then you you gotta sit back for like two weeks while you're, uh, what do they call it, but to ensure that you don't got COVID or contracted COVID or anything like that. So quarantine, they put you on two weeks quarantine. <laughs> um, once I got done with that, I mean, I went back to Afghanistan and or uh, Afghanistan. I'm sorry, went back to uh, Syria and. Uh, at the point I was getting back, man, um, the guy that was with me, uh, he was also on, he went on leave, so they had another guy come and replace him, a couple different guys, now those guys, I, I can understand, the one guy was an absolute criminal, I'm not gonna mention any names, but darn, I mean, this guy, one of the biggest things that the military teaches you is, uh, fraternization, you know, officers aren't supposed to, or, or NCOs aren't supposed to fraternize with, with, with soldiers, low-level soldiers. You know, civilians and, con and military aren't supposed to fraternize, etc. You know, it, it's good to have a work good workplace environment, but you can't be like buddy-buddy type of deal, right? And uh, this guy, he would never work. He would stay up all night with, with the military. You know, uh, who knows what the hell he's saying. Never did any work whatsoever. He was there. He was there for about a month or so at, when I got down there. Was sleeping until about five p.m. every day. It's the middle of the day. I'm doing all the work, and he's sleeping in until like five p.m. And then he's going and he's hanging with the military because uh, they were friends from before. And you know he'd buy them like shirts and shoes and stuff. I'm like, dude. Not only are you fraternizing, uh, I can't pronounce that darn word. Fraternization, fraternizing, um, but you're also buying their respect. <laughs> That's exactly what I felt like. I'm like, okay, some bitch. <laughs> nah, um, yeah, the two guys that kind of replaced Charles while he was on leave. That we're not even gonna talk about that. Um, but it was so awesome when when Charles got back. You know, I still keep in contact with Charles from time to time. You know, he'll he'll reach out to me, and you know, we'll be able to talk and whatnot. So that's good. But uh, when I initially got back um, in January of twenty twenty one, I kind of had this little list on my on my wall, and every two every week or so, I cross out a number, and um, I was counting down until my house would be paid off. Or what my estimated belief was that the house would be paid off, because all the money I was saving was obviously going towards 
was going towards that, that savings account, and once I got that number high enough, I was going to pay the house off all at once. And I estimated that if I had worked 14 months straight, 14 months, and there weren't no major expenditures, my wife didn't like blow up the car, need to buy a new one, anything like that, in 14 months, my house would have been paid off. Then, so that means February, approximately February, maybe early, maybe, no, I, I probably would have come home in March 2022. I would have come in, come home in March of 22 for uh, my wedding anniversary. So I would have been back in country for roughly 12, almost 13 months. And uh, no, so January would have been 12. So yeah, it, it would have been almost 14 months. It would have been almost it been about 14 months, and um, and then in June, uh, early June 2021, you know they come in with some flatbed trucks and some 40 foot uh, shipping containers. Now I'm not gonna take my butt and start trying to shimmy my way up up this Connex. So they they never took down the the Connex. Uh, they had to have. They had to have the guys with the crane take the connex off of the flatbed truck. So you're basically shimming your way up like 10 feet up this truck to get onto the flatbed. And then you got to shimmy your way up another 7 feet to get up the connex. And I'm like, man, I ain't doing all that. <laughs> I ain't got the strength, this upper strength to lift myself up that stuff. No. So I get on a forklift and, you know, I'm being lifted up. Done it a hundred million times. Lifted others up a hundred million times. Lifted myself up a hundred months. It's not. It's not a big deal. But for whatever reason, my stupid butt decided to put my hand on top of of the uh, uh, top of the frame. And going up initially, it was fine. Um, then we hit. Once you hit this certain this certain bump, you know, uh, there's a couple different bumps when the the forks are being lifted up. And, um, so I kind of lost my balance. So I had to like resituate my hands and instead of having my hands flat on the frame, I'm thinking that maybe my, my left middle finger was kind of dangling like this because when he went up again and, uh, the little levy, whatever, it caught my, my finger and I, I originally just yanked it out as quickly as I could. And I looked at my finger and there was this big, big giant hole and, I'm like, man, I can't believe I just did that. I, I just ripped off my finger. Um, yeah, literally, I thought I lost my finger, but or at least the the tip of the finger. Um, luckily that that didn't happen. I pulled my hand out just far, just fast enough. Now eventually the the nail started turning all black and it was just disgusting. Eventually it fell off, but uh, the guys the the doctors there. The, the uh, Navy doctors, they were able to stitch it back on, and I didn't want to go home. I knew they were going to send me home for that. Not just back to Iraq. I mean, they were, they were going to send me home, home. Uh, you know, it's I didn't lose my job. I mean, I got injured. So it's not the same as some of these other jobs. But at the end of the day, you know, six months later, you know, I'm finally healed up, or at least that's what the doctor claimed and I was ready to return back overseas and they tell me that they couldn't hold my position they had to fill with someone else you know I wasn't fired and I didn't have I was doing my job well didn't have any complaints about me in fact I got letters of recommendation and, and whatnot written for me and talking to my buddy he, that's, he said that's not true there were plenty of job uh, positions available so what the heck is a big deal why they couldn't bring me back uh, to my old spot you know I feel like you get injured on the job you should be able to go back to your to your old role um, so he said that they didn't have any spots with Lockheed Martin but there may be something available with Acoma Technical Solutions and Acoma is kind of like a, a subcontractor to Lockheed Martin and I will talk about Acoma in the next video, and it's probably going to be like a five-minute video. 
And in that five minutes, I'm probably going to spend four minutes and 57 seconds cursing up a storm because I hated that company with every fiber of my being. And you know what? Employees are the face of a company. You're the, you're the face of a franchise. And you, you think baseball, right? I'm a Cubs fan. You know, I always loved Anthony Rizzo. I always thought, hey, Anthony Rizzo is the face of the franchise. Further back, I think of Sammy Sosa as a fan, the face of the franchise, right? So, employees represent your company, and you you hire the wrong people, your company is going to look bad, plain and simple. And the the leadership that I had with Acoma, uh, my boss there in in Iraq, uh, with Acoma, we were actually back in Erbil, Iraq, which was nice, but I wasn't on the same compound, of course. It's gonna be it's a quick video, man. Uh, I was with the company less than two months. I've never deployed for such a short period of time, but if I didn't leave, and plus I had a slip and fall which injured my shoulder, which yeah, that's fun. Two years later, this thing still hasn't healed. Um, but that that was one thing, and with the bar with. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'd be surprised to learn if she ever kept her job any much longer because she is literally, was literally someone that every person that ever met her hated her guts. Uh, despicable human being. And I'll talk more in depth about it, I guess, uh, in the next video. But Lockheed Martin, one of the biggest companies on the planet. Worked for them twice. Uh, after the first time, I never thought I'd go back. I never thought I'd work for them again. I thought they were horrendous. Again, it's the personnel. You can't blame a company in in full, but there are certain companies like Mantec being one of them. Well, pretty much any company you could think of does it, but they have preferential hiring. You know, it's gonna be friends hiring friends and not necessarily hiring people that deserve the 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 job. Um. Yeah. So that that's my my rant about Lockheed. Um. After Akama, that's actually going to be the last video. So no more contracted videos after that. And based on viewership, I don't think many of you guys get too much of enjoyment out of these videos. But, you know, I think they're fun, though, uh, to, to an extent. It's got to be the right person who's interested. Um, these really are niche videos for a lot of people. And I think eBay videos that I make are kind of the same thing. They're niche content. You, uh... You got to be looking for something specifically uh, or want question, specific questions answered in order to really enjoy these videos. But uh, hopefully uh, more than just a few actually enjoy them. All right, guys, uh, I am going to close the video here. Uh, thank you so much for watching um, until Wednesday's, uh, Wednesday's video, which I'm really going to enjoy. And I'm actually going to stay down here and probably film uh, the next couple of episodes. So, um Definitely be look out for Wednesday. Uh, super excited about that. <laughs> Thanks, guys.